chances are gone. That's impressive. This is like a Guinness Book of World Records, I think, here. That's three minutes, pizza gone. <laughs> awesome job. All right. So, so it's a, we're about five minutes after 12, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Jessica Mortigy. I am from the People and Culture team. And uh, so there's some days I have to say that I, I wake up and... Uh, I, most days I wake up and I love my job, but there's some days I wake up and I'm like, I have the coolest job ever. And today is one of those jobs, one of those days. Um, I'm so excited uh, to be able to introduce our next guest. So uh, the the three of them are just a trifecta of amazing talent. And if I started to list off their achievements and accomplishments, it's just it's jaw dropping in terms of what they've achieved. And what I think is so very impressive, and what you'll be able to get a glimpse at as they talk is not just the impact that their ideas are having and that they're putting out in the world, but the very essence of who they are. They're three just amazing human beings and their character is just so inspiring in terms of how they're showing up in the world. So with that, I'm gonna introduce our first badass speaker, <laughs> Monica Orline. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I am thrilled to be here. Thank you, Jessica, for the invitation. And I'm thrilled to share the spotlight today with two other amazing speakers and researchers and thinkers. So I feel like I'm in for a treat being here today. I am a compassion researcher. I've spent the last 15 years trying to understand the nature of compassion and particularly what compassion means in the workplace. And I wanna share with you today just a couple of stories about what work is like and use those stories to help unpack what we mean by compassion and why it matters <clears throat> in companies like this. So it's not obvious to people when I first stop, start talking about compassion that it should really matter to them in their workplace. Um, and so I want to tell you a story of a woman who I'm going to name T. I'm going to name her T um, in honor of my Finnish um, colleague here. T is a woman that I met in Finland who just embodied compassion. I thought she was incredible. And the story that I'm going to tell about T is set in a hospital. And um, the reason I'm telling you a story set in a hospital instead of a high-tech workplace is so that you can, you can kind of imagine that this only happens in hospitals. But pretty quickly, I think you'll see that it happens everywhere. So T is a highly competent, incredibly professional nurse. And she's working in the cardiac intensive care unit. And as she is rounding first thing in the morning, she discovers that one of the patients that she is assigned to monitor has an irregular cardiac rhythm. Now for a hospitalized patient on a cardiac unit, this is a big deal. This is akin to um, an emergency. And she very quickly goes into action to figure out what's going on and why this patient has an irregular cardiac rhythm and it hasn't been adjusted or treated yet. And she goes to the cardiac physicians and she goes to the medical record and she goes to the night nurse who's leaving the night shift and she discusses the treatment options and what has happened and she has a complete knowledge of what's going on with this patient when rounds begin. And rounds begin and <clears throat> in academic teaching hospitals, you all might have had this experience, rounds means like 20 people walking around um, visiting patients and there are attending physicians and there are residents and there are medical students and there are nurses and there are occupational therapists and there's a bunch of people. And um, T's patient comes and the attending physician looks at the chart, looks at the cardiac monitor, looks right at T and says, why have you allowed this patient to be like this? And T begins to answer, the irregular rhythm was, she gets about that far, and the attending physician says, this is unacceptable. This is unprofessional. I don't know why you even still have a job in this hospital. And he proceeds to berate T and call her unprofessional and call her names in front of 20 of her colleagues. 
And she has all the knowledge about this patient, teed up and ready to present to the physician, and she never gets to talk about all the professionalism and all the work that she has done to care for the patient. And being a professional, highly trained, experienced nurse, she stands in the line of fire, right? She listens to what the attending physician has to say, and she finishes rounds. And then she's walking down the hallway, feeling devastated by having been humiliated in front of her colleagues. And as she's walking down that hallway, she sees that her manager's door is open, the nurse manager of the unit. And because the door is open, she slips in there, and she sits down, and she just dissolved into tears. The manager, luckily, has some deep empathic skill and says, T, you're a great nurse. What is going on? What happened? What possibly could have happened? At first, she thought something must have happened with a patient. Uh, and after T told her the story of what had happened, the manager said, let's figure this out. Let's get to the bottom of this. So she walked T through her immediate response. And then she went to the attending physician and asked some questions. She went to the night nurse and asked some questions. She went to the cardiac unit manager and asked some questions. And she brought everyone into dialogue around what had happened to T in this situation and brought awareness to the physician and to everyone else that T hadn't made a mistake. Um, she, in fact, had done an excellent job and that the unit as a whole was failing by virtue of treating her this way. So what does it teach us about compassion? When we define compassion as social scientists, we basically say it's a four-part human experience, and it always unfolds in relation to suffering. Now, most people think that that means that um, suffering happens in life, right? That someone gets ill, that a beloved family member dies, that someone goes through a divorce or a difficult breakup, and they get compassion because they're suffering by some vir virtue of something happening in their life. Um, in T's case, suffering is happening in work, and it's actually created by the work. It's created by the work interactions. And so the first thing that happens in response to that suffering is that it gets expressed somehow. Now, in T's case, it almost didn't get expressed because if she'd been walking down the hallway and her manager's door was closed, she would have kept on with her shift. And the professional norms of her occupation and her organization tell her that that's exactly what she should do, right? She should carry on. Um, she should behave professionally, which means even if she's deeply suffering, she continues to do very high quality service. And often in our organizations, these kinds of toxic interactions, political behaviors, difficult relationships, miscommunications, errors and mistakes, create exactly the kind of situation that T found herself in. And if it doesn't get expressed, the organization never has a chance to be compassionate. Right? So part one of the human experience of compassion is that there is suffering that gets expressed in a social world. Once that happens, then what we have to do is we have to make sense of it somehow. And T has to make sense of what's going on in the situation, but so does the manager. Right? And as we make meaning of these incredibly difficult situations, um, we can make meaning of them in ways that move us toward empathy, or we can make meaning of them in ways that move us further away from empathy. And the other thing I know about organizations like this one and organizations all over the valley is that when we are trying to make meaning of suffering and we think, oh my god, it's a highly competitive place and 
Thank goodness that that happened to T and it didn't happen to me, right? which may not be your personal experience, but which is the experience of a lot of people in a lot of highly competitive or limited resource situations. They make meaning of other people's suffering in a way that says, thank goodness, it didn't happen to me. And that makes them actually less able to feel empathy instead of more able to feel empathy. Sometimes it's because you think somebody made a mistake and you don't want to be contaminated by their mistake, right? You don't want to be blamed inadvertently by empathizing with them. So there are all kinds of ways that we can make meaning of people's suffering at work that don't contribute to our capacity to connect empathically. T's manager, as I said, thank goodness, right? knew that T was a constant professional, right? Her reputation was working in her favor in this case. And also the manager felt that it was part of her managerial world and her managerial responsibilities to listen to T, to allow her space to express her emotions and to then investigate and figure out what had happened. Now, I don't know about your experience, but my experience in the work world is that not every manager thought that was their job. Right? Um, so um, the manager interpreted the situation as T deserves my empathy, and then um, had skill and capacity to engage empathically and to use that empathic connection to take action. Right? So we have expression of suffering. We have meaning making. That's part two of the human experience of compassion. We have empathy and the connection between people. It's part three and then the action component. And that means that both T and the manager take actions that move them from that empathic connection to an action that alleviates suffering in the situation. So T feels comforted and um, her, her suffering is alleviated by the words and the listening of the manager. The manager's action actually brings other people into the circle of concern in a way that makes it possible for the other nurses, the other professionals, and the other doctors to see T differently and to think differently about how the unit can work together. And that's where compassion and work is so deeply wedded to everything that we're trying to do in Silicon Valley companies, right? I could tell T's story as a story of workplace suffering that happens to sales managers or account reps or customer service people or product managers or coders because I've listened to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of compassion stories from many different industries and they have these four things in common in the human experience. And when you code them, right, and you look across a huge body of evidence, um, you find that compassion in our human experience of work actually feeds five really important things that our organizations care about. Now, first of all, not surprisingly, it creates retention, right? Like someone like T, who is a really great professional and somebody that you don't want to lose from your talent pool, is much more likely to stay in your organization if when she encounters suffering, she gets greeted with compassion. So as we are all working to try to create really talent-filled organizations and make them places that people want to work, compassion is the key ingredient in that recipe. Um, the second thing that, or, that compassion and the workplace creates and that you can see in T's story is it creates engagement and engagement of not only the person in the work, but also of the customer, the client, or the patient. So there's a link between engagement at work and service quality, or in this case, care quality. But there are two more really important things for every organization that I know. Right? They want to have people working in the organization who don't just show up physically to work but they bring themselves, they bring their authenticity, they bring their heart and their mind. And you guys probably know because Jessica has told you that um, Gallup tells us that 70% of people in the world are walking around their workplaces not engaged in what they do. They show up physically, but they don't show up with their full 
humanity. And so if we want engagement, and that engagement drives high quality service and the capacity to connect with our customers or our clients, then compassion is a key ingredient in that recipe. And the last thing that is unexpected until you look at a story like T's story and you think, wow, I never thought of it that way, is that compassion is a key ingredient in learning that fuels innovation, right? If you want a highly innovative company and you are punishing people for errors, you're not gonna get there. If you want a highly innovative company and people don't feel like they can be at their creative best, you're not gonna get there. Um, in T's story, the unit would have been less safe and less able to deliver high quality care if T and her manager had not circled back and showed the physician that it was actually the physician's behavior that was creating um, a less safe, um, less learning oriented culture, right? That, that to create the psychological safety that drives learning and fuels innovation, compassion is a key ingredient. So I'm going to tee up my colleagues here by just letting you know that I deeply believe that today's theme, badassery, um, means that compassion is a key ingredient in be becoming a badass human being, and that as we really embody that in our work and come to understand it as part of what we do every day, it creates the possibility for badass organizations. Thank you. Hi, how's everyone feeling? Nice. All right, let's get this going. So I was. So my name is Amelia. I'm originally from Finland, living in Palo Alto with my husband currently. I was super stoked when Rebecca, <laughs> when uh, Jessica, sorry, when Jessica sent me an email asking if I would come and give a speech on Sisu, because you know, have you seen this thing in Facebook that? Entrepreneurs are those crazy people who work for 100 hours so they don't, they don't have to work for 40 hours for someone else. Well, there are some cool things that come with being an entrepreneur. You get to choose your title. That is actually my title. So, the resident badass at CISOLED. And since time is a factor, I'll jump super just deep into the topic that uh, I'll be presenting today. So. We've had this construct in the Finnish culture for thousands of years. Uh, first expression of it in the written form, we can trace back to about 500 years. And it's a word that it stands for this kind of extraordinary courage when we're facing really tough situations in our lives. So it's not the kind of stuff that, oh, I couldn't find a parking space next to, next to Walmart. But it's more like when things really happen, when there's loss, when we need to take challenges that feel like they're way beyond our comfort zone. So some years ago, I went through a really tough time in my life. And as we, you know, often we think that adversities only, they break us, they make us weaker. But what we know from research is that there's this thing called post-traumatic growth, which when we have enough support, when we have enough time, we can actually not merely, merely return back to the base level, but we actually grow as a result of this. And my experience led me uh, to a completely new path in my life. And I started asking the questions of how do humans overcome extreme adversities? And what do we know about that? And Steven Pinker from Harvard has said that we're living in the most peaceful time in our human history right now. But the truth is that you only need to like just get your flipboard or check the newspaper or even look in your own family and you see and we know that there's a lot of stuff that we humans have to endure. Being human is it's a really hard job. And so I wanted to start asking the questions that what could we learn about this cultural construct from my own life that we've had for such a long time. So the thing with Sisu is that it doesn't have a direct translation in any language. 
And it's, called, it's often said that it's the most integral part to the Finnish culture, and yet no one could really explain me what it was. So this became the kind of the path that I took, and I, will, I have so much stuff that I could actually share with you. Um, I got data from 1,000 people, but I tried to select something for today which is very practical and hopefully something useful that you can carry with you um, in your lives. So the thing with badass people, uh, in lack of a better scientific word for it, you know, uh, is that what kind of comes up from my data is that it's a way of life, you know? Those people, instead of thinking about stuff and things that they should do, they courageously make these micro actions in their lives. So they say yes to challenges that seem a little bit difficult or even impossible at a time. So the thing with Sisu and this kind of courageous life is that it's a very experiential thing. And I sometimes get called an, an expert on Sisu when I go give speeches, and it makes me super uncomfortable every time because the truth is that only in Finland you have like five million experts on Sisu, you know, uh, transcending pain, insecurity, uncertainty, taking challenge the challenges that are way beyond your comfort zone. And in, over, all over the world, we have millions and millions of people doing that every day. So Sisu, it's a universal capacity, which we all have the potential for. Um, an example from my life. Um, so I'm a very avid runner. I love to road cycle and stuff like that. And I've lived here in California now for a couple of years. And I have to say, it's super easy to run here. I mean, the weather is perfect. For someone coming from Finland, you know, which we get like five days of sunshine every year, if we're lucky, you know. So it's very nice. And what I've learned, so what happens every single time when I go home, which I do several times a year, because my PhD research on Sisu is based there, um, I go home and that's what happens. And, you know, but there is a blessing in disguise in this thing, because it's not like running in a snowstorm requires Sisu, you know, because Sisu means that you have to really tap into this kind of a second wind or something that allows you to take action against all odds. So it's, uh, but whenever we take, do something in a situation where we feel like it makes us push ourselves, every time we, we're building this tiny little roadmap. So we get, we see how we function in a difficult situation. And that's why it's so important that we say yes to challenges and things that frighten us. Um, still a couple of years ago, I used to be incredibly afraid of public speaking. I mean, it was so bad that I, I actually fainted before my first speech a couple of years ago. But what I did was that I made this conscious decision that I will say yes to every single opportunity that comes my way, and then I'll figure it out after. I mean, that is the thing, that we have to take that first step into the unknown and trust that when the time comes, we're able to rise up to the occasion. And the problem is that when we don't, if we don't do it, we never know how strong we are. That's the thing. So it really is when we expose ourselves to smaller and bigger challenges, we have the chance to choose our mindset. This is an, actually a photo that um, was selected as the best press photo in Finland last year by our biggest newspaper. So I mean, that is like real life circumstances from Finland. So it is no surprise that we had to come up with a word for uh, overcoming tough days and stuff like that. Um, and the thing with um, Sisu is, I'll actually go back for one second. So I often say that Sisu is kind of like a rubber band. So when you have to do difficult things, it means that it stretches, you know. It becomes bigger and bigger. And sometimes if you look back in your life and now, let's say, if life is good, it's easier, and you look back and you think like, wow, like how did I ever overcome that thing? Like I could not do it. But that's the thing that there's this phenomena that William James, um, a philosopher, physician, this genius prodigy who lived about 100 years ago, he called this the phenomena of second wind, that we have this extra power tank that is there, but we don't have access to it unless the situation really calls for it. Um, does anyone know who this badass is? I would say that this is like one epitome of Sisu. He's um, 
Mark Allen. <laughs> so he's a six-time Ironman world champion. And Ironman is this super long uh, triathlon competition where you, I mean, I have the distances in kilometers, but um, you pretty much you swim like over two kilometers, and then you bike 180 kilometers, and then you do a marathon on top of that. So he, maybe we might think he might know what he talks about. And so last weekend, I took this um, seminar led by Mark, and there was a lot of really cool stuff that he said, and it was great to learn from someone who's really had to push themselves physically and mentally. But this was this one thing that really stuck with me, is that are you living what you're asking for? And it was a great moment of introspection and reflection for me as well, you know, because there are often these things that we really want, you know? We want to, we have this um, ideal image of ourselves um, it, and things that we want, but then in the daily life, when we could take those tiny micro actions, we often don't do it. So getting the, I think I read from your website, Pedro, that there was this line there that said that ideas that are not executed don't exist. Well, we could go into a long philosophical conversation whether they exist, but there will be, they will not manifest themselves in real life if we don't do anything about them. So there's deep wisdom in this, and I'm a huge proponent of helping people find the courage to make those tiny little changes um, in our lives so we get to start moving toward that uh, place. So I'm, I believe that sisu and courage, all these things, um, sisu is a verb. So it's more about taking action and doing things than just this idea that exists somewhere in the universe. And so instead of complaining, you know, I'm a social activist in, in addition to being a researcher, and I heard myself often complain that, well, you know, like someone really should do something about like stuff like, you know, loneliness and things like domestic violence, which is uh, something that I'm very passionate about, uh, eradicating domestic violence. But then two months ago, I decided to say yes to a pretty crazy dream that I've had for years, uh, which is to run the length of New Zealand, which is 1,500 miles. It'll be about 50 days. And the cool thing about this is that I said yes to something that I possibly cannot actually do right now. So 2016 will be the year of heavy lifting, and it means that running a lot, and also just building all the resources and the things that you need to do it. And it's a perfect example of how, because in life, like all the modern civilization and all the amazing advancements we have, it's been done by people who had the courage to step into the unknown before they even knew that there's anything there. So, and where it all comes from is that uh, someone asked me recently that, so Amelia, why New Zealand? You know, like, why don't you run across Australia? And I'm like, well, uh, probably because I would die, <laughs> you know? So when we choose those challenges, whatever they are, a key component here is that you also have to know yourself. So you mirror and you compare and you get this, you see what you can actually do in that moment. So the point is that you set such goals, and I call them micro-actions, because when you do many of them, they will become this bigger entity. Um, so knowing thyself is a hugely important thing. Um, this from my, and what my father always, always tell me, tells me, and since we we're in the team of badass, and when he heard about my New Zealand plan, he's like, Amelia, remember that there is a huge difference between a badass and a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when we choose those actions that we want to do, um, I often say that our sisu should be informed by reason. So to have too much sisu, that might lead you to stay in a relationship or in a job or in some kind of in a friendship or in a situation that is actually harmful for you. So we have to also know that if we tap into our sisu, this inner capacity, does it enable life to unfold in the best possible way? Um, and so in Finland, for the first time in our like, you know, history in thousands of years, we're nowadays, we have an official day for Sisu, and this is the second year. And last year, we wanted to, we had lots of different events there going on, but we also wanted to engage the world. So we had this event on Day of Sisu, which is this Saturday this year, and we call it the Hour of Sisu. 
And we wanted to inspire people to do one badass thing that scares them during one hour during the day of Sisu. And we had people who, you know, a lot of them had to do something with sports. People sign up for Ironmans. They went for their first run. They swam in ice water. Um, one of the most moving things was one of my friends, she called her former friend who she'd been in very bad terms for 20 years because of something that she did. And she called this other lady to ask for forgiveness and they reconciled. And I think those are really powerful things. And so I challenge everyone here on Sunday to do something that takes you a little bit closer to something that is a meaningful thing to you. Uh, but it's a little bit tough, or it can be super tough. Get you. And so another thing that I want to bring attention to is that there's this myth around badassery and being courageous, that there are these, these self-reliant uh, people who just do it. They have the strength, they have, they're somehow just have these superpowers in whatever they do. But the truth is that behind every person who's ever done anything super cool, there is a massive number of other people who've helped them, maybe in a practical way, or it could be in the form of uh, what Monica was talking about, how we treat each other compassionately so that we open safe spaces, so we're courageous to take these chances, you know? So it's very important to make sure that when we speak about badassery, that we do that in the context of understanding the broader system, because we're all very deeply interconnected in our daily lives, and we have such a massive power to open doors for each other, but unfortunately, it works other way as well. So we also can close doors from each other. And <laughs> yeah, so check yourself before you wreck yourself. So make sure your badass is not bad. So when we cultivate this ability to do really cool things, exceed ourselves, take crazy, amazing challenges, um, it's important to remember that badassery or courage or sisu, they're all tools, you know, they're, they're neutral. So they only, they will merely amplify what's already in there or already out there, what's in you, you know. Uh, last summer I had the huge luck of uh, being part of this uh, Singularity University uh, GSP graduate school program, which is a 10, 10 week program at NASA Ames. And we talk a lot about exponential technologies there. And there's a lot of people who are very afraid of tech. Um, and there's, we had a lot of discussions of whether it's good or whether it's bad and what are the threats and all that. And one of my biggest takeaways uh, from that discussion was that technology as well is something that it will only amplify what's already in there. So what will we humans do when we have access to this technology? And, um, and this quote by, I think it's Aristotle, it may have been quoted to other people as well, but he once said that educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And so to me, it's super important to remember that the true badassery, exactly in the lines of, with, uh, in the same line with Monica, is that often the most scariest thing we do um, is when we have to really show up as who we are. And it's not easy often. I mean, we're hardwired to look for threats in our environment all the time. Martin Seligman, who's this um, badass professor in psychology, so he once said in one of his talks that we scan our environment hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of times per second for any possible threat that we may see. And the reason is that it has survival value. So we have been hardwired to do so. But at the same time, if we don't show up being honest, being authentic, and I don't mean hashtag authentic, but I mean like the kind of uh, authenticity that really opens space for other people. Uh, and we don't wear masks. Um, it's something that I believe we don't afford to not show up in an authentic way because that's the only way to build trust. And trust is built in those in-between moments with each other and there are lots of tools how we can do that. It's, it's in our looks, how we see someone. It can even be how we say someone's name and do we listen to them in a given moment. Um, 
with the chance of totally losing any potential badassery points that I might have got with my New Zealand thing. Um, to me, I mean, badassery is this. <laughs> I saw this yesterday when I was checking for images, and to me, how I define success and badass is and the number of people that I personally have been able to open doors, and how I, when I see what I look for in other people, is how they treat each other. Do we stay present for others? Um, do we create an environment where there's space for failure? I mean, in Finland, we have very low tolerance for failure, and it's something that our culture really suffers from. Because when you're in that space, when you're not, you don't, you don't feel courageous enough to even you know, tell your most quirkiest and weirdest ideas, like in your example, you stay quiet. And imagine those realities that are not, that don't exist at this very moment because someone didn't share their ideas because they were afraid. And so we know from research that compassion, uh, creating safe spaces, which is a really cool thing research by Otto Scharmer at MIT. He talks a lot about safe spaces and holding space for someone. So those things are correlated to, correlated to perseverance, uh, innovation, creativity, all these things. If badassery was a scientific term, like I hypothesized that it was correlated to that as well. Seriously. So this quote by Ludwig Wittgenstein, I think it's, uh, it's pretty profound. The limits of our language means the limits of our world. So what we don't have the words for or the language for, we can't discuss these, these ideas. And it means that we might not be able to unlock the potential that those concepts, concepts withhold. That's why I think Sisu is a cool thing, because we don't have a word for this um, ability to keep on going when you feel that you've reached the end of your physical or mental abilities. We don't have a concept for that in psychology right now. But now that we have the stories that we can ask and we can share, they start living a life, and they start building these narratives and give people ideas and examples of what we are able to do when we take the uh, chance. But in addition to uh, the limits of our language, what I believe is that the limits of our compassion, courage, and this badassery, they also mean the limits of our world. And when we talk about badassery, it's a word that we toss around so much. I'm actually personally not a huge fan of the word. word. Because I used to toss it around so much that it's like, you know, the saturation point came and, you know, now. So I'm going to look for a new word if anyone has one. <laughs> but the limits of all of this stuff, it really means the limits of our world. And it's so important that when we develop these skills to do courageous things, that we spend enough time also thinking that in addition to realizing my own dreams and my potential, what am I doing? with making the life you know, on this little pale blue dot that we're all living a little bit better through that badassery and through these amazing qualities and the things we have. And I really hope that next time, or maybe it's on day of Sisu on Sunday when you do something cool, maybe we can all include some kind of a element that will help us include other people into our badassery as well. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Emilia, for the wonderful talks. I love these concepts of compassion and the concept of Sisu, which I had never heard of, but that's great to learn. Um, very powerful talks. I'm very honored to share this stage with you today. And I, I do want to give thanks to two very special people who are very badass, and that's Ellie Harris, she's here somewhere, and then Jessica Amortegi. Would you mind giving them a hand for putting this together? and for bringing us all together here today with some wonderful pizza, some wonderful speakers, and then me, which I'm on the other side of, you know, um, not as wonderful as they are, but I love this theme of badassery. I love the word. Um, it has been on my favorite words for a while, and I do realize that I'm, for some of you, I'm standing between you, between you and some late lunch, or just standing between you and work, which means that if I talk too much, you're gonna hate me because you love working. Do you agree? Your managers are here. So I'll be brief um, in talking about this. And um, what I remember most is how I felt. Is this feeling of loneliness 
is this feeling of inadequacy, is this feeling of not belonging, is this feeling of being somewhere, but at the same time wanting to hide so desperately. I was walking back home in the scorching heat of Brazil this one afternoon, crying my eyes out, wanting to jump off a cliff, and I was just coming back from the principal's office, whom had told me again that I, again, was this close to being expelled from school again. And in my mind, I was thinking about all the people whom that piece of news would possibly disappoint. And all I did throughout my whole life was just disappoint people up to then. I was maybe about 13 years old. It was just to disappoint people and disappointing my mother, who, bless her heart, had worked so hard for us to at least be able to go to school at some point, and my brothers and grandmother and everyone else. So there was a lot of feelings of frustration and then of anxiety and all these things put together in the mind of a 13-year-old that just made me feel terrible. And I said, okay, I, I would much rather just jump off this little cliff here and just be, and just be happier than, than what I am today. And my mom, bless her heart, she suffered from many different things. She suffered from having an abusive husband for a long time. She suffered from not having an education. She suffered from not having anything to rely on. And when my father left early on, on the verge of having anywhere to go, we packed our belongings and we moved in with my grandmother and my great-grandmother in this tiny little apartment in the middle of nowhere. So there were six people, three of whom were children, in this very small and confined place. And that was, and that was really tough. Um, and she used to tell me that God never made mistakes of any kind. And I, you know, the, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you know? and I was like, yeah, right, I have the faith of an avocado seed. <laughs> and nothing seems to be working. Um, and the overall feeling was, relating to what Monica said, I guess the what the nurse was feeling, perhaps, is that, I don't know, but maybe that was sort of what it is, is that this, this, this overwhelm of always, or knowing that you will always be a burden to somebody else, no matter what you do. Have you ever felt that way, maybe, at some point in your life? No matter what I did, it could be you'll be a burden to your wife, or your husband, or your parents, or your children, it doesn't matter, but the point is that that was the, just the overwhelming feeling. And to most people who hear a story such as this, that's it, right? That's the end. It's like, you know, a kid is born God knows where, daddy leaves, mama can't work, no schooling, that equals just another nobody. But yet, this is how stories like these can go wrong. Open quote, this touched my heart when I, heard, when I read this, like nothing has ever touched my heart. An open quote, there are cracks in everything. And that's how light gets in. Close quote. And there are three particular events in my life where two particular cracks, big cracks, where life got in. And the first one was, I remember this day very vividly. Maybe about three or so in the morning, 13, maybe 14 years old, I was... Please don't ask me what I was doing there, because I, I don't even know, but three or so in the morning, in the very dangerous side of town, and I was just walking around, very dangerous place, and I, and I remember trying not to step on people passed out on the streets, and like trying not to step on syringes and pieces of glass, and there was prostitutes and these older homeless people, and I still don't know how I didn't get kidnapped that particular day. But here is why this was so powerful and which I remember up to this day, is that I, as I was there, trying not to step on things, I saw myself becoming those people. I saw myself transitioning into that. I saw my future, and that was what I was supposed to become if things continued to go the path that they were going. And there was something within that it wasn't a voice, it was just a feeling that maybe said, don't give your power away like this. The second thing was a set of great coincidences was that not, long, not too long after that, a cousin of mine gave me a, he introduced me to books 
and to chess. And for the first time, he taught me how to read. And then I started getting very interested in books, started getting interested in philosophy. Amelia quoted Wittgenstein and some wonderful people here, like uh, William James. Started getting interested in them, and we would start discussing. And something interesting happened was that I started becoming much more confident because confidence comes, it has to come from somewhere. It doesn't just come from nowhere. And it came from the knowledge that I was acquiring from reading those books. And the third thing, and perhaps the most significant thing, was that this cowboy from the United States, in the, the United States, he had this dating profile on this dating website and to which he was paying some sort of subscription. And it was one of those dating websites where the, the guys pay money and the, the women don't pay money. So he had this profile and then he says that he was about to take, that, take his profile out of that website. And then he gets a message from this woman who says hi. And then he replies back and he says, I love your picture. And little do you know, about two months later, he's in Brazil and he asks my mom for marriage. And six months later, they get married. And then my two brothers and I and my mom, we move to the US. And America is the most wonderful, to the most bad, sorry, to the most badass place <laughs> in the world, the United States. And I loved it. And my house was just like a regular middle class house, but to me, it would just look like a big castle. Man. And I had my own bed, and then you would turn on the sink faucet, and water would come out. Not just cold water, but hot water. That's amazing. Um, so that's the story wanted to briefly share. And um, in thinking about what could I possibly offer that could possibly be of value to you in these few minutes we have together, um, I thought just last night, actually, thinking about this, I thought about three things that, perhaps three lessons that I have learned from, from these events that I would love to share with you that have helped me in this path to becoming. I'm not there yet. Some of you in this room are, but I'm, I'm still getting there. Of, of becoming badass. Um, and um, the, f the first one of which is, I think it sets the tone and the stage for everything. And I think Monica and, and Emilia talked about this very beautifully. It's this notion of helping people. The first step to me is help others. Because everyone is fighting a very tough battle that we don't see. It's this notion of a duck syndrome. Have you ever heard of it, by any chance? It's like, imagine that you are in this pond, and you see you are a duck, whether you like it or not, and then you see all these other ducks, and they're just making their way so beautifully throughout the pond, and you look at them, and you say, oh, this is amazing. They're so pretty, and there's a perfect duck family, and there's a perfect female duck, and a perfect male duck, and everyone looks so pretty. But that's the surface. That's what we see above the water. But when you go underneath the water, when you look at them, every single one of those ducks is paddling so hard. And that's what we don't see. I, you would think that, for example, Harvard students would be just perfect, right? Harvard undergrads and graduate students, that they don't have many struggles. And you'd be absolutely wrong. They're wonderfully smart, but the need for mental, mental health counseling has exploded these past few years, and they just opened a new clinic that functions from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. on campus, and it's packed every single day. So on the surface, we would look at them and say, wow, you guys are, your guys are amazing. Some of you come from these extremely wealthy families, and you have everything. And then underneath that surface, they're paddling so hard, and they're going to these mental health counseling sessions, and they are there, losing their sleep over stuff that gets in their way. So everyone is fighting a tough battle. I met with a, had this great privilege of meeting with the, with the CEO of a, of a rather large organization not too long ago, and he shared with me that his daughter felt like killing herself because she feels that she's too ugly. And he's asking me, what do I do about that? And he's telling me that he had done everything in his power to help his daughter, and, but nothing was working. And here's what's so fascinating about this, is that she won't listen to his voice. But why should we help 
other people extend a hand is because you never know whose voice you would listen to. It could be yours. My mom almost killed herself in a metaphorical way, just in telling me, Pedro, I want you to study. I want you to read books. I want you to be smart. I want you to do things that all the kids your age are doing in a positive way, but I never listened to her. But when my cousin told me, dude, sit down, you're going to read right now. He got this book. I listened to his voice. So we never know whose voice. We never know whose. You never know someone whom your voice could impact and who would listen to your frequency, just you. Um, and then the second thing is um, don't give your power away. When I was walking down that road and trying not, not to step on people, it would have been very easy for me then to just say, here, you take it. That was my power. When we give in to imposter syndrome, when we give in to self-sabotage, we're giving our power away. And let me tell you this, I don't care that you are the best saleswoman or salesperson in Logitech, that you're making a ton of money. That makes absolutely no difference as far as your susceptibility of being in situations where you feel like giving your power away. Um, that's the second most important thing. And lastly, and this will finish my promise of being brief, is that I would like for you to imagine that this world in which we live is called this field of opportunity. And everyone, before they come into this field of opportunity, is given the same tool, a shovel. And for the purposes of just this, ex of, of this example, some shovels are better than others. Some people are born with more things than others. But what matters here is that you have a shovel. I have a shovel. Everyone here has a shovel. And the first type of people, they usually use their shovels in the following way. They pick a spot where they think they can find gold, and they start digging. And they dig and dig and dig and dig. And once they hit a rock, they give up and they move on to the next hole, and they start digging again. And they dig and dig and dig, and once they hit a rock, they stop. And they move to the next hole, and the next hole, and the next hole. And before they die, their field of opportunity looks ugly. It looks like a field of half-dug holes and half-built dreams. On the other hand, there are some people who come into this world, who grab their shovels, and they start digging, and they dig, and they dig, and they dig. And once they hit a rock, they continue to dig, because they know that it is underneath their rocks, those rocks underneath those adversities, that gold can be found. And here's what's so interesting about this, is that maybe you don't have the strength to break down every single one of those rocks. And that's why we need help. I could not possibly as a 13-year-old, break down that big rock that was standing in my way. So my cousin was behind me, helping me, and I gave him my shovel, and I said, please, do this for me. But he was there. Had he not been there, that would have not been an option. And perhaps I would not be here today at all. And throughout the lives of many people, and I would assume in your life as well, you've had to deal with many, many rocks that have allowed you to be here. It goes from having to study and um, making good grades in college or staying late many nights writing those very complicated lines of code and preparing your call, call, or sales calls for the next day. And throughout my life, I have followed that same pattern as well, having to break so many difficult rocks. Um, when I arrived in America, I could speak zero English, and plus I struggled academically with math and with many other academic subjects as well. Um, so those were reasons for me to just stop and go dig something else because the expectations that people had of me in my high school, I moved to South Carolina and I was in rural South Carolina. Can you imagine like Pedro in rural South Carolina? That was, <laughs> and plus that movie Napoleon Dynamite had just come out. So vote for Pedro was the thing. Um, and the expectations that people had of me, this kid who don't speak English, was that at most I would become a gas station attendant later on. And that's it. 
And that's really easy to give in to expectations. It's really hard to defy expectations. And today I had the incredible privilege and very incredible honor for which I give thanks every single day of being a, a teaching fellow at Harvard and of being able to do research on campus and of being in contact with these wonderful students every day. So to summarize and to finish, I, no matter what, help. Everyone is fighting a tough battle. Then two, don't give your power away. And then three, no matter what, keep digging. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you at our March speaker series. Thanks.